Hi, this is Tasha Austin, host of Critical Conversations with NJT Saul and JBE, where we discuss how to counter anti Black racism in language education, starting with ourselves. Our resource is Begin from Within by Lavette Coney. Our guest is Maggie Churchill, president of NJTSA and JBE. Thanks for joining us. Now, let's have a critical conversation. All right, so welcome to another episode of Critical Conversations. I'm your host, Tasha Austin, and I'm going to allow my guest to introduce herself. Hi, Tasha. I am <laughs> Maggie Churchill. I am the current president of NJTSA and JBE. I'm very excited to be here. Um, so excited to actually meet you, although hopefully someday <laughs> in person we'll meet and not on Zoom. One day. One day. <laughs> um, I am a middle school ESL teacher. Uh, I've been doing that for quite a while now. Um, and I also am an adjunct instructor at two universities in New Jersey. Um, I teach, I usually teach the methods and materials class for ESL bilingual um, teacher candidates mm -hmm. who are in certi like either the certification program or the master's program. Um, and I also work in district very closely with districts who are um, getting cohorts of teachers to be certified for ESL or bilingual education. And that's like, I can't think of a better organizational, professional uh, alignment, right? Basis to be in to have yeah. these types of conversations. And I was just saying, off the recording to Maggie, how um, grateful I am under her leadership as the current president and, and our efforts and what we're doing. Um, and knowing that we don't have a, a blueprint, but that it's important enough for us to push on and, and do what we can and take all the wins and learn from anything else, right? And thank you for leading the way on this. Oh, my pleasure, honestly. Um, so Maggie and I are gonna talk today about the work of Dr. Lavette Coney. Um, and the piece that she wrote, Begin From Within, which made me really excited to see simply because it's kind of the entire premise of this work that we've been doing um, since the statement in May, um, we took the framework for la racial literacy based on Dr. Celie Ruiz's um, archaeology of self, which is kind of like a taxonomy and at the top is racial literacy. Um, but the entire work is digging into your own understanding of who you are, how you show up in the world, and how you develop racial literacy. So to find a work that's so well aligned that talks about beginning from within, um, I think it resonated. I looked at that jam board and like you had to drag the post-its around to even see all yeah. the posts that were there. So that yeah. said to me that it resonated as well. So my first question, Maggie, usually is, and I'll do it again, like just how did the piece strike you all together? Just reading this piece from Dr. Lavette Coney. Well, and for someone like me, it's 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 finally. Um, so as someone who's beginning on their journey of awakening um and needing that those um guideposts and signposts of okay, here's here's where you start, here's what you look at, this is what it, um things might look like or sound like. Um, I, I never had that experience, um, you know, was never part of my education as a teacher um, or as a teacher leader in New Jersey. Um, and so it, it's critical for me, um, this whole journey, and I'm, I'm very open and honest about it and wanting to share this. And, and as you and I both know, wanting to then take the journey that we've been on and the steps that we've gone through so far this year. And of course, I'm always thinking, because I'm always thinking of um, our members and, and our constituents, but also the teachers that I work directly with, how do we bring this back to classroom? Uh, because that's the question that I always get asked. Okay, we're mm -hmm. going on this journey, um, but yet how do we then bring this to others? How do we bring others along in this journey? And, and that's always a perspective that I'm thinking of because I know I'm gonna need to raise these issues um, and raise the consciousness of others who I'm responsible for um, and yet I'm only building the awareness myself. Hmm. Um, so I'm very aware of that. Um, and I'm really, I'm really looking for guidance from you um, as to how we might do that in, in terms of thinking the conversations we've had this year in our organization and on this very podcast, how, in terms of the next steps, how do we then bring this forward to a larger group? How do we include others in the conversation 
and how do we expand that conversation outwards? Yeah, for sure. And I, th- I don't even think I said our little tagline, right? So it's critical conversations, countering anti-Black racism in language education, starting with ourselves. And um, in saying that tagline, I really think that it comes to life when you dig into the work. Um, it, it's not really something you can even begin to discuss unless you're doing something first. And I, I hear that in your response of saying like, if I'm just beginning, how do I get others to go with me? And I think it's a, a valid um, curiosity, particularly for those who realize the, the importance of the work um, such that you're not satisfied with it just being like what I do as a singular individual person. We have that framework that we work from with the concentric circles that has the self in the middle, but then it grows outward to institutions and systems. Um, I, think, I think even that model is important to consider that at times we, even though we're working on the self closely now, uh, we're, we can always be thinking in that larger circle and that larger framework and, and yet go down kind of expand and contract it's like a scientific process here right of of expansion contraction can happen simultaneously or it can happen that it's not necessarily limited to just that little circle um and i'm often seeing you know what are the other roles how can we involve other people and i know it's work that i have to do first to move you know eventually outward um but i'm thinking of that at the same time yeah and i think we have to hold all of those things in mind at the same time um I think opportunities become more apparent when we are always doing the work. I think it's much less likely that we will recognize our strength and our responsibility if it's a a switch that we're flipping, depending on our our environment. So, you know, when I think about those circles and I think about our organization, I already am seeing the ripple effects, right? I'm seeing some folks, um, like we get emails throughout the week of folks who are finding professional development, folks who are finding really good readings and they're sharing it within the organization. No one is telling them, go find more resources, right? We have our subcommittee and that is our responsibility that we signed up for, but there are folks who are not on the subcommittee who are now also sharing resources. That says to me that folks are taking this up on a personal level. And in addition, um, when we think about within the organization, right? So we have a subcommittee, but then we have um, other committees in the organization who are responsible for other facets of what we do who are now realizing their role either in upholding white supremacy or in beginning a self-reflective work in realizing that I could be doing more to counter anti-Black racism. And I think um, the more that it's done on an individual level, the more that we'll see the ripple effects in larger spaces. So um, I think it's only going to continue revealing itself in terms of where it gets taken up relative to the, 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 the level of engagement that folks are having on an individual level. I don't think those types of ripple effects would even show up if it weren't being taken up on an individual level. And I think it goes in fits and spurts too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think we have to be comfortable yeah. with lulls and then like lunges forward. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. So I don't think it's going to be a smooth journey. Um, so I have the first question that I pulled from the jam board, which says, what does it mean to recognize my own racialized being? How do I show up in the world as a racialized being? Hmm. Yeah. And, and again, as someone who's new to the process and new to the journey, um, I think it's definitely um, your contributions, you know, I, I'm always thinking about the, the different, I guess, because I'm always in these situations where I'm working with other groups and, and knowing um, where this has to go for either classroom or student interaction. Um, and I'm always kind of aware of that. So I'm looking to shine the light on others and looking for them to give back to me. Okay, so again, where's your comfort level? Mm-hmm. Um, where would you begin? You know, what is it? Because I think when you're doing this kind of work, you have to, again, starting from within, but starting from what do you know, right? Can we begin from that point? Um, And what does that look like? And making that very public and saying, I really don't know much. I haven't had a background in this. This is not something that was ever part of my teacher education uh, background. And, you know, and even in the state. So, uh, you know, shocker, disclaimer, I'm not from New Jersey. 
Um, <laughs> although I really enjoyed hearing your discussion about New Jersey in the last podcast and what it's like there. We I'm couldn't help Philadelphia. ourselves. We couldn't help. Ourselves. I know. I understand. And I'm from Philadelphia. So I'm always finding myself as like, you know, slightly the outsider in different <laughs> situations, you know, I, and so I'm very mindful of that. I never wanted to be, you know, me telling you what to do. Um, and oftentimes as either um, a teacher practitioner, I'm in that position where people are asking me, well, what would you do? And I'm like, I try to always turn the table and say, well, where would you begin? Yeah. So it's really what you're comfortable with and what you know. Okay. So let's start from that. Why? Because it's a starting point. And for if you if you haven't started, you're going to begin somewhere. That's right. And I'm so glad you said something about like understanding like the value of silence. You're like, let me just kind of wait and hang back. And I don't want to tell folks what to do, but also acknowledging like the the unlearning that has to be done because there were some great, it was hard to pick these questions. There were some great questions on the There's jam some board. Great questions. Yeah. And one and of them talked about the unlearning piece. And so when we talk about like, how do I, what does it mean to be a racialized being and, and your comment right now of like, but what do you know, oftentimes even the starting point is unlearning because yes. once folks say, oh, but I know this, even the one thing that they've been holding on to, oftentimes is not true. Correct. Right. And so I kind of, you know, I guess I'm visualizing almost like a number line in math. So it's like, you know, where do you start learning? You think of zero. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm kind of in the negative range because you have to unlearn. So unlearn is that negative zone. Right. And then I'm not, I'm not seeing it to be judgmental, yeah. um, but more of enter. I'm, every time I read these great resources, I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah. And now I see that. Now I see, you know, why letting go is so important, why unlearning is so important, because it's part of the education. It's yeah. a part of, of becoming um, awakened in what this looks like. And so it's almost like a, a pre-step, right, to beginning is the unlearning factor. I agree. And I also think that the fact that we just tell folks, but you've got to start, you've got to get started. Um, can feel uncomfortable, particularly for those of us who are drawn to the field of education, right? Those who might have felt like we learn well and we do well in settings where the goal is to like acquire knowledge in some way for someone to pull the ground from under your feet in that way and say, start by starting, as right. opposed to like start by taking these very particular linear kind of steps can be very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but again, if your starting point is negative as opposed to zero then it's just it, that is the work and it, and, I, and it doesn't have an end goal so for so many um folks as soon as they hear the word race or racialized they honestly don't even necessarily see themselves as a part of that conversation right um, many of us are groomed to believe socialized to believe that race is something that other folks have like races for black folks races mm -hmm. for folks who are not white and right. so you know even trying to acclimate everyone to understanding that because race is invented, a social construct created for domination and power in that way, like it exists as much for white folks as it does for black folks and everyone in between. Um, and that it changes depending on the, the needs for dominating populations and maintaining control in these different social sectors. So I know for me, um, especially when it comes to working with pre-service teachers, um, it has to start by looking inward because the natural inclination, not natural, the socialized inclination for most of my students, because my students generally are not people of color. Most of my students, when you bring up race, the, the first inclination is, oh, those people, those mm -hmm. students, right. those others, others, right. distance, right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the reflection piece, um, I would think, you know, I, I'm going to jump a little bit because I felt like a lot of folks responded to the actor, ally, accomplice language in the reading, you know, at, at, along your journey, my question would be like, do you do, do those terms resonate with you actor, ally, accomplice? And if so, how might you use them along this journey to counter anti-Black racism? Well, you asked us questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think it's important to recognize the terms and again have the sense of distance, um, which might help when you're you know doing this kind of work and having to decide, okay, 
where is my own thinking in this? And where is my own, you know, reaction, my own ideals to this? Am I, am, and can I be any of these roles or different roles at the same time? Um, and so I think that perspective is important um, and that sense of distance and maybe even encouraging folks to have that kind of conversation. I think it's so important that it's a conversation. Um, and that's why this, this mode of what you're doing is so important as well, because when, when you're able to discuss the same topic together mm -hmm. um, and start to look at um, actions or examples critically in terms of, okay, wh which could this be? I think we go in and out and almost in between um, these roles at different purposes for different, you know, different times and different reactions. So I think, I think that aspect of being able to, you know, objectify or look, look from a different perspective or look from distance um, will help people kind of recognize, you know, what their response is to something and then keeping that and moving it on. I think I uh, definitely something I want to start to do if I only had time, right, um, is the aspect of just kind of journaling and taking something saying, okay, here's a moment when I realized this um, and I really need the time to do that. But I think it's so critical in this kind of work because it's almost a document. I need to almost document the awakening process mm. in terms of what, where am I in this continuum and how can I recognize um, when I go through these roles, um, when, whichever one it is. I think for me, I need, to, I need to objectify something to look at it and say, I need to look at my behavior this way or my choice or my thinking um, or, you know, was there a moment that struck me and why did that, you know, what made that, moment apparent to me, um, at least from my own perspective. I think that's what is most helpful. It's just really my own advice that I could offer. And I, and I, to build on that, I noticed a few times in this piece, it was recommended journaling, reflective mm -hmm. journaling. And I think about, um, there's a, there's an article, um, a colleague of mine, Dr. Porter put out about racial awareness and using the archeology span of self with her students. Um, they did a project, a photo voice project. I've never used photo voice, but I, I got the gist of it from the article that they kind of like, it was like image, you post images um, on a shared space, like kind of like a Padlet board. Um, but there were key questions um, of what those images were going to reflect. So as you're talking about this possibility of thinking about the categories actor, ally, accomplice, and, and journaling and reflecting, when did I show up as an actor? When did I show up as an mm -hmm. ally? When did I show up as an accomplice? Um, I think even more expansively, just because it, again, my background is world language and I'm always thinking like multimodal engagement, right? Like right. access opportunity, all the ways that you can demonstrate your own literacies, right? Because it's mm -hmm. not always reading, writing, speaking, listening. Sometimes it's representation. Sometimes it's modeling. Right. Um, and so I'm thinking about that article that Dr. Porcher wrote about how her students would snap images of like different experiences they had that they deemed racialized um, right. and how from the image they were actually even able to unpack almost like you said, awakenings or recognitions right. about um, not just like who they are, who they thought themselves to be, but how they showed up within a context. Right. And so that to me is, um, again, because race is not real. If you were isolated all the time, you would not recognize yourself as a racialized being, right? Because right. It's, exactly. it's when you show up within a context and that dynamic begins to play out right. that you recognize that, you know, this social construct has material consequences, right? Like, what is happening in this space and, and how is power being leveraged or taken away or manipulated um, and based on what? Um, and I can think like, <laughs> it, like I'm getting all these ideas now, right? Because we prepare. I just got one too. I just got one too. Because <laughs> we prepare these students to go out. Yeah. And and we're, we're both like, huh, maybe. We how do we do that? that? And I just thought of, right. So I'm thinking of, um, are you familiar with BTS, visual thinking strategy, like the no. methodology of it? No. Oh, so powerful. So it goes so well with what you're saying about selection of images. Mm -hmm. um, and, and our students respond to this, right? Particularly of this, you know, I teach early teenagers. I've taught every grade, but I'm, you know, in the world of middle school, it's its own beast now. Um, but I've taught high school as well. And, you know, the power of media, we talked a little bit about this before off camera, but the power of media and selection of images is so um, relevant to their lives that you know so much a part of themselves and um, Instagram culture and you know images that are there for a moment and then move away um, but 
getting kids to take a critical look at an image um, that, that you select um, and having a closed conversation, a guided conversation around that image um, is really the crux of what VTS is, visual thinking strategy. So you just project an image and you always ask the same questions. And so it's really, they're really probing questions mm -hmm. that ask the students, what, what's going on in this picture? What do you see here? And so it really does come from your own perspective at that point. Um, and then when you ask, when, when the students give their responses, you ask them, what makes you say that? Mm -hmm. So again, their focus returns to the image. What in the image, what in the picture makes you say that? Um, and then everyone is really in the role as active listener, which is another great um, way to reinforce this role. And so the awakening is to just listen, right? So, so we don't often get the chance to do that, but to encourage students to do that, and to show them what that looks like. Um, and then again, your final question is to just invite again, what more do we see, right? Yeah. And so the next person participates and your role as teacher becomes that of, of one who paraphrases and just points to the image, where do they see this? And then invites more conversation. So I'm really taking myself out of the role. I'm not someone who is making the observation. I'm not someone who's sharing. I'm just facilitator. Um, but it's so empowering for students because they really get quite deep. They take a very deep dive and a lot of issues come out simply just by looking and listening. And VTS is a great way, great strategy um, that teachers can use with any type of critical image. And it, mm -hmm. it just works so well with beginning awareness and beginning awakenings. I'm, I'm excited about that for a few reasons. I'm excited thinking about how our last episode, we focused on the need for racial, like, like historical racial literacy. And so in the selection of potential images in, in conducting BTS, I'm thinking about how when we start this journey, um, even if all you have is a beginning of an awareness, you can still select powerful images for students to then ask good questions and, and try to kind of extract from them their realities as they make sense of the image in front of them. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking about how building our own racial literacy, understanding that the historical anti-Blackness globally could help us be very um, strategic in selecting those images. Like if we went um, the way of like uh, the photo voice, the Dr. Porcher kind of methodology where you have students select the images, that's powerful as well. Yeah, right. Um, and I could just see a lot of possibilities with that. And so from the concentric circle kind of point of view of thinking of the self, um, when you're journaling and when you're thinking about when did this happen for me or when did um, I first realize that I, I have a race or when did I first realize that, you know, there was a differentiation in the way that folks get treated based on race? Um, all of those are great probing questions when we're at this beginning stage, um, particularly if we're looking at ourselves and then understanding that like, it's not a linear work that says, well, when I get there, um, right. then I'll invite someone to come with me. Like it's just ongoing and expansive and definitely not linear, at least of what oh. we've seen here, right? Right. <laughs> um, but I do think that that connects well to um, a question that was clearly personal on the board, um, who it looks like it's from someone who's thinking about this classroom practice again, and understands like, I wouldn't say the limitations, because I think teachers um, constantly find ways around the, the rigidity of what we're faced with in terms of classrooms. But the question said, to say it's okay to be different is difficult to process in a standardized academic setting. How do you break that mold? Now I'll say that that seems very general, but in looking mm -hmm. at the rest of the questions around that question, I do think that these kind of reflection processes that we were talking about, like doing photo voice or visual thinking strategy, I think you called it, um, bringing in critical imagery and probing questions, um, supporting students with their like racial understanding and historical knowledge of colonialism, patterns of you know domination and white supremacy around the world. I think from a practitioner's lens to ask this question, they're trying to figure out how do you bring this into a this setting that, yeah, that, right. that might say, well, these are the standards and the, the standardized test is coming. I think that's what, what this question is getting at. And they say, how do you break that mold? 
and I think, you know, there's always such a drive on, you know, that we know the tests are coming and does this meet the standard and I, I have to meet the curriculum and these are all the things. So, you know, the, what the curriculum outlines are really more skill. It doesn't, it doesn't address um, text selection. It doesn't address um, kind of even topic selection. So, you know, I'm constantly reminding teachers and showing teachers that's really your choice. Um, and in some cases, teachers feel very locked in to what they know they have to cover or, you know, and, it, you know, they're quite surprised when I say, well, I don't teach out of a box. Like sometimes you're, you get the box and the textbook and the teacher's guide and the workbook and the work. Like, I don't have that. I've never had that, which is very, you know, liberating and, and, and also scary at the same time. Um, but I've always been grateful that I've had the opportunity, opportunity to, you know, select text or um, to kind of, you know, I guess, respond to what my students needed um, and respond to the topics that they wanted to um, learn about or discover. And I love the idea of working again with what you have, which is often, the, you know, our teachers are very resourceful. Often in times ESL teachers don't get um, you know, the prepackaged material, everything, you kind of have to work with what you have. So why not work with what the students bring to us? Um, and can we have them, you know, guide a discussion? Can we have them start a discussion, teach them how to have a conversation? It's so critical for English language learners, that, you know, to build that. Um, and something that I do in my um, methodologies classes, we always try to make a practical application with talk moves. And mm -hmm. so there's tons of talk moves that are out there. It's just a general term for lots of different ways that you can have kids have this structured academic conversation, but it can be about any <laughs> topic. And we typically have these conversations about what we're reacting to in our world um, and have them, you know, either read an article, read an article to together, or we respond to a video where we have these conversations using talking points that show them how to engage in the actual conversation, how to start a conversation, how to extend on what someone said, how to respond to, how to agree. What's the language of agreeing? What's that look like and sound like? And this goes along the process of awakening is that what is the language that we're using to teach our mm -hmm. students how to engage in critical conversation with others on this topic? And so, as you know, there is a direct language that you know we have to work through and teach through, but what is the language that goes along with this awakening that kids need to learn and how do we facilitate that? I there's I'm like jotting notes as you speak because it's sparking all these thoughts that I'm having and I'm thinking specifically about how you because I I was like trial by fire in my own uh, teacher preparation they gave us no text either and when I went into my student teaching um, placement I too was kind of making um, making those selections on my own I what didn't have a hard text that I was stuck with and like you said it's like a, a gift and a curse because you're very excited to then draw from the students lived experiences acknowledge that they already have so much that they're bringing to the classroom that they can be leaders in that space um, I did something very similar in my student teaching where you know it was like current events let's pull the newspapers let's have a discussion let's have a debate um, and really had really rich discussions that students brought their lived experiences and their knowledge to um, and that I could moderate right and fill in some of those gaps because sometimes our students too are coming from kind of imperial nations or those who have been uh, under colonial patterns for so long where they also are coming with what they believe to be founded and evidence-based um, understandings of how the world works when they realize, like you said, and why did you say that? And you ask them to kind of pull evidence and they realize that they don't necessarily have evidence, right? And then we can fill in those gaps and support them because we too are doing our own work towards building historical literacy, racial knowledge, so that maybe they can even also realize that, oh, maybe that is just lore or mythology or white supremacy, um, these understandings that I have about the way the world works around me. So the skills-based curriculum, I think of Dr. Goldie Muhammad, I try to like read across like literary scholars, those who study literacy, those who study uh, English and those who study uh, second language acquisition and, and world languages, because there's so much to glean from these scholars that work in these other areas. And just like you said, in terms of it being a skills-based curriculum, Dr. Goldie Muhammad talks about how important it is to have historical literacy 
um, because the curriculum only gives students skills, right. um, but it doesn't develop their identities. It doesn't address intellectualism. It doesn't address um, these other core pieces, particularly for students who come out of like a black tradition of like literary like brilliance. And, and how do we learn when we're not allowed to read or write? How do we learn when we're you could be punished um, for having a book, for reading anything outside of the Bible, right? Um, yeah. And so there are a lot of historical traditions within um, the formerly enslaved um, of the United States where they've always found ways to, to learn even when learning was against the law. And so when I hear you say that we have this freedom, it's true. And I don't think a lot of folks think of it that way in terms of the freedom to select materials that could allow for students to get more critical about their place in the world and maybe the, the function of race within that world. I have, um, I have student leadership in the way that I do the methods courses that I teach, all courses that I teach, I'd step back and I ask students to lead and guide discussions. But similar to what you're saying, with these guideposts, with these supports, not just to help them develop the discipline specific language, but to kind of like be the guardrail too, to bob them over when they're kind of drawing from more opinion than right. evidence. And they realize pretty early that they don't have the historical knowledge. They don't really know um, how things came to be even here in the United States. And my students largely are not from diverse backgrounds. They're typically US born, monolingual, English speaking, usually white, usually female students. And so they feel pretty confident in the education that they've received until we begin to have these conversations and they realize that they don't, they don't even have a working definition for race. Right. So um, I think you really point out the possibility there when you talk about like, how do we break this mold? Frankly, we're not realizing the freedom that we already have, right? right? Yeah, I would agree with that. There is a question there that brings us back to the organization from that practical side of breaking the mold of academia, of breaking the mold of what we're expected to do. And it says, in our organization, how do we foreground the unearned benefits of whiteness to acknowledge its role in perpetuating anti-Blackness? So swerving back to the organization, again, like this racial literacy, how do we, how do we center the unearned privileges and benefits of whiteness and the role that that plays in maintaining anti-Blackness? And that's, you know, for the organization moving forward, that's a core, a core component of its mission. Um, you know, we serve students who are so diverse in the state of New Jersey. Um, and yet in the context, as you talked about in your last podcast, where it's, you know, the Mississippi of the North here in New Jersey, and as an outsider from, you know, Philadelphia, I, I have to say, I see that. And I'm in many districts and I'm like, wow, it really is, you know, racially polarized in New Jersey. Like, wow, what is, how did that happen, <laughs> right? Like, and, and we know how it gets there. Again, you know, the sort of systemic levels um, and as an organization, you know, how do we, um, again, engage and cultivate um, members and representation um, that, that reflect more diversity? Um, and it's, you know, right now a struggle, of course, given a pandemic, um, it's hard to get, you know, people to join a volunteer organization. We are a volunteer organization. Um, that's, you know, the voice of bilingual dual language and ESL educators throughout the state. Um, and we're so fortunate to have the strengths and expertise in the history of involvement that we've had, um, but it does need to reflect more of a diversity. Um, and so a lot of, you know, I'm hoping that being involved with you know, early teachers, teachers who are early to career um, in the settings that I'm involved in, you know, again, that they're very diverse, they have diverse backgrounds and they, they don't, you know, follow that. As you mentioned, you have like students all from that kind of same whiteness background. I don't have that in the, um, the teachers that I'm working with. So I would love to cultivate and see them, you know, again, they're brand new, brand new members, um, to see them move into um, a more prominent role, either through local chapters or get involved with the organization, come to our conference, um, submit to our publications. Um, and there's so many different ways we need to, you know, increase our diversity, but we also need to get more people involved. And it's a hard thing to do right now in a pandemic, you know, we completely understand. 
Um, but I think one of the answers is, and we've talked about this before, um, even in our board meetings, is to kind of grow and cultivate the relationships that we have um, with other members that we know um, by having a mentorship, by having um, that direct contact or that direct reach to, you know, specific focused uh, members or groups. Um, you know, what can we do to cultivate that type of, of diversity in our own organization and, and have that reflected? Two things that stood out to me about what you said. One is I'm thinking about how in this tiny little state, we have such different um, populations yeah. that we're working with like that. That is just is amazing to what we said the last podcast of how is it that we're both working with pre-service language educators right here in this tiny little state yeah. and the, the students that with whom you work look totally different than the students yeah. with whom I'm working. So right. that already tells us like we've got work to do, right? And, and the possibilities, because I do acknowledge, you know, I even said to um, some of my students the other night and I sent them some readings to substantiate because I'm telling you a lot of what our students reach for as truth is myth. And it's, it's, it's a prevalent myth. It's a functional myth that maintains white supremacy. So one that was like, um, I just, I feel so bad for these underprivileged students who um, they close the schools on them. And that means they can't get access to anything that they need. And I realized that that is like a very popular thing that folks are saying, mm -hmm. but I had to send them readings to help them understand that so many um, students who are home are thriving. And a lot of them that are thriving, it's because that they are less in contact with race, racist incidents that happen at school. And so again, for the bubbles that we can live in based on whiteness, based on privilege, based on suburban redlined districts and, and you know uh, educational gerrymandering that says, if you live across the street, you can't go to the school that's well-funded. Right. Right. Because of that, um, you know, I have students that are in young adulthood who, who honestly do not believe that the, there are homes that are loving and full of resources that Black students and that um, students from other countries can benefit from prior to coming into an institutional space where they might be confronted with racism or with like a, a setting that is really not good for their identity and not good for their development and understanding who they are. So it's interesting when I think about the population of students with whom you're working and, and where I find myself and how they could benefit from one another. So we're talking about mm -hmm. contact. We're talking about exposure. Right. We're talking about on the organizational level, if we're thinking about unearned benefits of whiteness, it's almost like a, um, um, an ignorance that you can have based on like, like you don't have to be exposed to things that make you uncomfortable, mm -hmm. quite literally that. And so if I'm thinking about um, the, the level of, what we can do to kind of shift how often we find ourselves in these insulation insulated pockets where this type of person doesn't come into contact with that type of person um i think we can really do the work i i, I think we opened our meeting up the last time right and i yeah. i was I was under a rock. I was taking my qualifying exam. I'm sorry. I wasn't there. So I can't even speak to like what we the, understand. I was under a rock. We um, understand. But I did see emails fly after the meeting and saying that, you know, that there were different voices in the room and that there were different perspectives in the room. Um, and I think that it could be jarring for us when we realize that we've ever had a role to play in any kind of gatekeeping or any kind of like maintaining those silos. But when we know better, we've got to do better. So like if we've come to find that by virtue of um, giving more access and more um, space to folks with perspectives of what it's like to have the lived experience of a Black person in language education spaces, um, maintaining those spaces to bring those voices to the forefront. And then, like you said, responding mm -hmm. to them, right? It's one thing to have representation. It's one thing to have um, a token or a person who can say, I, well, we have one of those, but it's another thing to get those perspectives and say, now, what will we do? Right. Yeah. So, and I, I mean, think, I think mentorship, you know, for, again, we, a lot of people who are on our board have, have served the organization for quite a long time. Um, and it's, it's really remarkable. I'm always amazed by the extent and the, um, the level of opportunity and that um, networking, you know, 
how it, it's almost like a small group that knows many, many people. And so it really is a matter of like, you know, reaching your hand out and kind of pulling somebody in through the door. Um, you know, we have that capability. Almost everyone on our board um, is very well um, established in their career. They've been in their district. They've been in their school. They've been in their role. Um, and they're well known to so many. So we're so fortunate to have that representation. Um, and maybe this is something we can, you know, move forward to and have that as a role, a future role of board members would be to mentor or, or bring on, you know, for the time, you know, when you know your time will sunset on the board, do you have a mentor in place? Is there someone who you can cultivate um, to help us, you know, represent more diverse experience? So I really, that, that to me speaks volumes because even my own engagement with, like I've been at my institution for five years, um, but really it was, and she's on the subcommittee, it was Jess Hudson that said to me, you know, I think you might be good in this organization. I think there might be a, and, and without that, like you said that. And look at you now. <laughs> <laughs> and look at me now. Well, well, it's funny because like, but still, right. That would have never occurred despite hadn't reached through it, it was direct contact it was conscious intentional engagement um and i think we we underestimate when we think about but it's just little old me and i'm just one person and we and we say but i'm just learning myself i think we underestimate what we are capable of and the flip side of that is the first episode in speaking with kaya and when she talked about that incident that had happened in in the school where her child was going we thought about the opposite of how one person could actually disrupt mm -hmm. um, um, if there is anti-Blackness occurring. There, there were so many people, she was talking about an incident where there was a tile that was placed across the um, hallway from her, her child's class that had like a really gruesome image of someone being hung. And there were so many people who had to turn a blind eye to it for it to happen. So as much as we're thinking about like if one person makes an effort to engage Black perspectives, Black expertise, um, get those voices in the mix, respond to them, do something about it, the inverse is also true when I think about it takes a lot of folks to be complicit, to turn a blind eye to anti-Black racism for it to reach, reach the institutional levels Level. that we mm -hmm. see today. So I think you make such a great point about that reaching out and that conscious effort and about not needing to be some kind of expert to do that. Right. Yeah, I am so grateful to have spoken with you today. Like, it's so true that because we prepare teachers, like our minds were like, ooh, could I do that? Could I do <laughs> I've been got waiting a long time for this moment. <laughs> I, I'm really, really excited about it. And I think we've got some great resources too to link under this episode, just based on thinking about what we've used, what we've tried, what we've read and where we'd like to go. So thank you so much for speaking with me today. Um, and I hope the conversations just continue organizationally and beyond. Thank you so much for having me. I totally look forward to it. And thank you again so much for everything you've done for NJTSL and JPE. My pleasure. Thanks for joining us this week for NJTSAW and JPE's Critical Conversation. I'm your host, Tasha Austin, and we'll see you next time.